All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and I want to welcome you to CRC Anthro's Anthro Stories with Mayoa Adegboyega. And I wanted to give you a couple of reminders before I introduce our speaker and our event today. Uh, please be sure that you silence your cell phones, and uh, if you need to sign in because you're here for a class, the sign-in sheets will be available in the lobby uh, during and after the presentation, so please be sure you sign in. And also, please be reminded that this event is being recorded, so if you uh, do not want to be in the recording, sit towards the back, and that will ensure that you're not in the recording. Um, so please do keep that in mind. I did also want to thank our media and facility specialists for as their assistance in this event, um, in addition to all the setup. Uh, as most of you know, we had to reschedule this event twice um, because of the poor air quality. I was a little worried today with the weather that we might have to reschedule yet again. Uh, so I'm really happy to see everyone here and that Mayoa was able to make it out from Davis to be here this afternoon. I'd also like to thank uh, CRC Equity, which provided some funding for this event, so we're very happy to um, have that as well. And to tell you just a little bit about Mayowa, although Ella will tell you, and Mayowa will tell you some more about that also, um, Mayowa is coming today from UC Davis, where she is a graduate student in the Department of Anthropology, and her research interests are on the evolution of the human pelvis. Um, in addition to that, she's also the graduate student assistant to the dean and the chancellor. So she gets to work really closely with folks on campus, um, like Chancellor Gary May, who I'm really curious, Mayo, to know um, more about what he's like. And so hopefully maybe uh, you and Ella will talk a little bit about that. And uh, just to give you a little idea about today's event, so as you can see, we've got sort of two parts. Our first part is um, an interview. And so Ella Lockhart, who's an anthropology student here at CRC, will be asking Mayoa some questions about um, how she got into anthropology, her background, what brought her to her research subject, and, and those kinds of things. And then after that portion, uh, Mayoa will um, give her presentation about her research. And there will be some time for questions. So if you have questions, uh, write them down, think about them, and uh, we will get to them. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mayoa to CRC. Thank you for coming. And um, Ella, take it away. Great, testing. <laughs> All right. So first, thank you for coming out to talk to us today about your story and what you do at your research. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. This is going to be fun. This is going to be lots of fun. So first, Promise. you are from Lagos, Nigeria. Yes. What can you tell us about growing up? Um, I think I had literally like a textbook family, like four of us, a boy, a girl, like it was very standard. Um, but I have a really, really large extended family. So growing up was a lot of family events, lots of holidays, lots of, lots of school. I think school in Nigeria is very rigorous. And so it was just like your day was just spent in school and at home. And I used to watch TV and like watch the Disney Channel and see like kids would get up to antics. And I'm like, when do the American children have the time? Like, what <laughs> are they, what time after school do you have? So, but life was a lot of fun. It was like a mix of everything you could imagine from like the most outrageous thing you could, like you could see. Like my brother always says that um, like Lagos is the kind of place where you'll see like a herder, like herding goats in front of like a skyscraper. It's just a hodgepodge of those worlds clashing all the time. So, yeah. That is pretty cool. And in school, like, what were your favorite subjects? Did you have an early interest in studying humans? Um, I, my favorite subject was like science. And when we broke it down, eventually, like once you know you get to secondary school, you stop taking science. You start taking like physics, chemistry, and biology. Biology was my favorite. So I think I'd always been interested in just how, like organisms work. So biology was my favorite, and I think that's the one I found the most challenging, but it was also the one I loved to get into the most. So I think I always had a bias towards this. I think I always kind of knew I was going to study biology in some way or form. Okay, so it's like a nice balance of you know? being challenging and interesting at the same yeah, time. Yeah, like you learn about so many different organisms, you learn about humans, you learn about like fish, you learn about like everything. Um, chemistry always seemed easy to me, and physics always seemed ridiculously difficult. There's like no reason to do this to yourself. I'm like, the building is only eight. Like, I don't care. I really don't. Like, it was so hard. 
I did fine in it, but I always just thought, okay, this one is too much, too challenging. This one is not as challenging. And so biology was right there in the middle. Okay, I agree with that. Those subjects are pretty hard. Um, and what made you um, interested in going to college in the US where you attended Howard? So I went to, so the school I went to in Nigeria was a British curriculum school. And so what that means is that it was somewhat of like an international school within Nigeria. And we ran on the British curriculum. Um, so our schools were structured like the way the British students would take it in England. And our exams were structured that way. So there was always, there was always this idea that many of us were going to go to England or somewhere in Britain for school. It, it, in a sense of we were sort of prepared that way and it only made sense. Because to then go to a Nigerian school would have meant you had to now take the Nigerian exams after school, like after you had graduated. And so a lot of people were heading in that direction, which was the direction I was heading in until I realized that you had to do A-levels. Now, A-levels are, think of finishing school and then someone tells you you have two more years pre-college school. That is as hard as college, but it's not really college, but you need it to get into college and you take only between like three to five classes and you have to pass or you can't study that major you want to study. Like no school will take you with those grades. And I was just like, that is risking a lot to like, I have to get three A's in physics, chemistry, and biology to get into this school. And I just decided at the age of 15, and I was really young for school as well. So I was 15 years old and I was like, I'm not doing more of this. Like I'm done, I'm done, I'm tired. I'm not doing more of this. And to be honest, American schools just seemed, I was like, you can just go to college directly. I want to do that one. And so I kind of bugged my family into the idea of going to America for school. I was like, wait, which other place could I go? I could stay in Nigeria, but I kind of wanted to do something different. And I was like, well, this is the place that'll let me go directly and not give me two more extra years before I get to go to college. And so then you ended up in DC. I ended in up Maryland. in DC because I applied to Howard University. Um, a friend from school had, was, had been bragging that she was going there. And so I decided, sure, I, that sounds like a good school. I'll go to Howard too, I think, I guess, if I get in. And so I applied to Howard. And then I got in and I loved the idea of going to school in DC specifically. I was like, it's the capital, it must be fun. It is, but I, I knew nothing about the place. I was just like, it's the capital, it has to be a fun place. Like there has to be things to do. They wouldn't put the capital somewhere that wasn't, you know, that things weren't happening. So that was my decision making process at the time. Kids do not try that, think more about your decisions. So but it like, surprised you, DC was not what you expected it to be. I, it, yes and no. So I expected it to be much more busier than it was. Coming from Lagos, which is like a state with 20 million people, the city inland is like about 14 million people. DC seemed like a small town to me. I was like, it was all, I would call home every day and be like, it's so quiet. They're so orderly and like there's no noise. There's barely any traffic. It's amazing, they're just so idyllic. Like DC was very idyllic to me. And so, but I also thought it was also interesting, like it had so many different sides to it. You go to the Capitol and it looks like, you know, what you would imagine Washington looks like. There's a lot of lobbyists and staffers running around, a lot of politicians and people in suits. And then you go to the museums and it's a lot of tourists everywhere. And then you go to where Howard is and it's more like an urban area. And so there was just all these different parts in this very small city that I really liked that idea of it. Did you get the opportunity to see the more lively cities on the East Coast living in DC, like going up yes. to New York City? So the thing about living on the East Coast is that there's public transportation. <laughs> um, <coughs> cough, cough. Um, there's public transportation and it's quite easy to travel around. So yeah, we would spend weekends in New York. My roommate would just say, I want to go to New York on Saturday, and we'd just pick ourselves up and go. Um, we'd go to Virginia, which was very, very close. Um, you know, we'd go to Florida. There was a whole bunch. It was so easy to get around and to move beyond states. I guess 
California, well, California takes up the entire strip of this end of the, well, almost, almost the entire strip, so. But it's, it's less, it's not as easy to like get from place to place here. Yeah, not at all. No, you can just hop on a train in DC and be in like three different straights take before you like woke up. It's yeah. amazing. It's much more convenient. That's much, nice much that you have the opportunity convenient. to do that. Yeah. Get yeah. out of DC. Yeah, and it also allowed me like to see the rest of America. I think I was always very curious because so, I'm like, DC being DC cannot be like the norm. It, like it's too specific a place. It's the capital. It's specifically built for a purpose. So I was like, this cannot be the rest of the country. And so I was very, very interested in seeing all the other parts. Mm -hmm. And at Howard, were you studying anthropology or what did you first No, I never, I didn't even, look, I didn't even know there was an anthropology major. At I didn't even know that this thing existed. I did not know what anthropology was till I got to Davis. Um, <laughs> I studied biology and I studied general biology and the plan was to go to med school. I'm a Nigerian child. The plan is med school, law school, engineering. Those are your options. Your parents will die if you did nothing, if you didn't do those three. And so I was on the medical school track. I was like, I'll do biology, I'll apply to med school, I'll go. And then I, you know, you sort of, you know, you're applying to med school, you know, you need like research and things under your belt. You need to apply for things. And so I applied to this particular research project that was in UC Davis. And so that was my first introduction to um, anthropology, and I wasn't even doing anthropology there, like, I, but it was the first time I'd even heard the word mm -hmm. anthropology. What were you doing? What was the research opportunity? Um, so I was doing research in the evolution and ecology program. So that's the through line. It was like, okay, so evolutionary biology. And I was working on the evolution of the vertebral column of coral reef fish. So very far from anthropology. The only through line is that there's evolution involved and there's morphology involved. Um, and so I was studying fish for a whole summer, just basically looking at clear stained fish so they're transparent and you've dyed their bones. So I was like, they just look pretty. This is fun. I like research. This is great. If I can stare at pretty fish all day, it's not such a bad idea. Um, but I didn't want to study fish. And part of it was like I wasn't really interested in fish. But another part of it was like, I could not imagine calling my parents and telling them, first of all, I'm not going to med school. Second of all, I want to study fish. I was like, look, the first part is already heartbreaking enough. I cannot kill my parents. Um, I will just say I'm not going to med school, but I'm still doing stuff with humans. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm still studying humans. So I think that's a good middle ground. And then that's when I discovered anthropology. Okay, so did you get to talk to the anthropology department at Davis while yes. you were there and that was right. kind of your introduction to Yes, it? so while I was there I'd expressed the interest and you know a lot of people, a lot of scientists, and a lot of like mentors that I have today um, basically said, oh you should check out the anthropology department, this is what they do there. Um, you should really, you know, think about going into that field. And so it was very brand new to me and this was my junior year. So before then, nothing. And then from that point on, I started doing a little bit more research on anthropology. But we didn't really have a, an anthropology, a biological anthropology department at Howard. So it was, there, there was like a few classes you can take, but it wasn't really a big thing. Um, so it wasn't really something I could explore when I got back, but I spent a lot of time like just researching what it was, what they did, and I just thought it was cool. It was like all the stuff you watch in the Discovery Channel. And I was like, oh, I could, I could do this. Seems fun. So how did you know that it was for you enough to take the next step to do your graduate research? Um, I, yeah, see, that was a leap of faith. That was not, to be honest, like I said, do not make your decisions the way I mean mine. A lot of it was just trusting that I would enjoy it. So I knew I enjoyed um, studying morphology. It was part of the reason I went to biology. It's part of the reason I wanted to go to med school. It was sort of the human body was always fascinating. So I knew I would enjoy that aspect of it. I knew that I liked research because I'd done research in different fields um, of biology. I'd never done it in paleo, but I'd done that. I had worked before in the medical school at Howard studying like muscles. In, human, in the human face um, on like cadavers. So I was like, okay, I can do this. I can also do like dead humans. I can handle that. 
I can even handle it in cadaver form. So I'm pretty sure a skeleton would not be too much for me to handle. And so the rest of it was, would I enjoy paleoanthropology as a general field? And for that, I just assumed, if I like these two other things, there's really no reason why I won't enjoy the rest. And the fun will be me discovering this field, right? It'll be brand new to me when I'm going to grad school, but it'll be like, that's my grad school, is discovering this brand new thing. So an educated leap of faith. Educated <laughs> leap of faith, right. I wasn't just like, I'm just going to go join a band. Yes. No, I was, it was still an educated leap of faith. I made choices, but a lot of it had to do with me just having confidence that mm -hmm. this would be something that I would pursue and enjoy. And then you chose to go to UC Davis, yes. where you do your research now. Right. How is that transition from living on the East Coast over to the West Coast? Um, so that was harsh. I did not expect California to be that different. I was like, there's still people, it's land, it's water. Like there's, the elements of life are the same. But it was very different. I always tell people that my transition from Nigeria to DC was not as stressful as my transition from DC to California. Like I moved continents and I handled it better. Um, I, think, I think because also this was the biggest cultural shift for me from Nigeria to DC was, Howard is a HBCU, and for people who don't know what that is, that's a historically black college and university. So Nigeria to Howard was not that difficult. It was a HBCU, so everybody was black regardless. And then there's tons of Nigerians at Howard because of that reason. So it wasn't that much of a cultural shift. Like I still had people around me who spoke my language, who we had fun with, who had the same references and the same points like, you know, upbringing. Mm -hmm. And then moving here was the first time I was like, oh, I am actually living in a place where I am the only Nigerian person around. And so that was a bit jarring. It was, that was a lot more jarring because it was the first time I'd made the leap where there was no buffer. And then I was also going into a field I didn't know about for graduate school, when people expect you to know things already. So that was a bit of a crisis of confidence. Um, I would go to lab meetings and I'd just be like, I have no idea what anyone is saying. I don't remember the name of any of the fossils. I should know this. Everybody expects me to know this. Why don't I know this? And so that was harsh. The good thing was that California is a nice place. Um, and so it could have been a lot worse. It was just, I think I just decided to enjoy it. After a while, after I'd gotten over the, this is ridiculous and I don't think I can deal with this, I just decided to, I was like, are you already taking the leap? And you've done this before. Just try to get out of your space and enjoy what is around you. So stop searching for yourself and enjoy this because you didn't move across the world to just hang and live in your own community. Mm -hmm. Right, like the, the, then I could just have being just- being present. Right, I was like, I could have just stayed in Nigeria if I was looking for that. But I wanted to explore the world and I wanted to see what else was out there. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was like, just be present in that space and learn things about mm -hmm. other people and other cultures. And that's what sort of turned the dial for me. Oh, that's great. And while you were discovering paleoanthropology as a grad student, right. not having the background that everyone else had, did anything surprise you or was it not what you had first expected? Um, everything surprised me because like I knew none of this and I, there were, I had, I was TAing undergrads who knew more about this field than I did. So everything was like, really, that's a thing. That's awesome. Um, wait, humans have been around for how long? This is great. And I'm like, I am literally doing undergrad and grad school at the same time. So everything was like shocking and cool and all the names were strange. I was like, Homo heidelbergensis, now that's a mouthful. That's a long name. Why would anyone name something that hard to name? Like, everything was surprising and shocking. I think I was, I was more surprised. The thing that I think I recognized the most was how laid back the field was. Like, and I'd never thought about it this way. It's a field full of archeologists, paleo, um, human osteologists. Um, and so it's a field where already your work is not necessarily very lab-centered. Mm -hmm.
And so there is a very outdoorsy vibe to people who go into this field. Like the thing that attracts an archaeologist to a field also is the thing that attracts them to do other things. Um, and it was trying to gel those personalities together that was mm -hmm. kind of fun. Um, because I'm not an outdoorsy person, like at all. But you've learned to be? I mean, they have, they have dragged me on a couple of hikes now. You know what? And that's where we're leaving that because, but it was just sort of like, oh, okay, I can, I was trying, I think what was surprising was like, how, how do I explain my presence in this field? Mm -hmm. Like, how do I explain this girl from Nigeria who was on a medical school track, who came from like a very specific kind of family, the, you know, sort of values, very, very different things in this field where I just was like, I don't fit here. Right? Everybody else here likes other things and I don't like them. Mm -hmm. or everyone else here is expected to do other things and I just don't enjoy those things. And it was like, how do I explain myself into this field? And that was the most surprising thing. It was like, I didn't realize that there's like a whole culture around this and like it doesn't have to be it's not like it's prescribed but mm -hmm. it was sort of like huh I wonder how I could shake this up okay. you know and that was that was pretty cool so how have you kind of found your place in that like at UC Davis with that with your department with brute with? force um, <laughs> just attacking everything head-on I think I just decided not to try to blend in I was like I'm never going to blend in this is not going to happen um, so it's more like I'm just going to approach it from my, from my personality and myself and my interests and my anything. I'm going to blend this world and this thing in my way. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and that was because, so when I, and I should mention, so when I got to Davis, the program that I did, the summer research program, was a UC HBCU initiative. And it was an initiative that the UC started to, um, to um, pretty much bring more underrepresented students to Davis, specifically African and African-American students to, to the California universities, to the UCs. And so that already was a premise that I was not going to fit into this department quite the same way as everyone else was. Mm -hmm. Because like, I, was going to, I was the only black student in my department. And, so, and I was the only one who had come from Africa. Like there was just so many things that I was going to be different in. I was the only one, I wasn't the only one who didn't have a background, but I was definitely the one who had the least background in anthropology. And so I was like, I'm already going to stand out regardless. So might as well approach this my way. And that's a really good lesson to learn too, not to blend in, to just Right. And I, I think I tried in the beginning. I was like, sure. I'll, but then after a while I was like, no, like they'll also learn things from me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even from my background in biology, they'll learn things that they don't know from me. Like, mm -hmm. I had to stop approaching it from I don't know as much as they do to I know a whole lot more about a thing that they know nothing about and vice versa and we can teach each other. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I approach like everything from my social life to like my academic and my research pursuits. Mm -hmm. And so for students that are here in the audience that may be considering anthropology or already are in, what kind of advice would you give to them? Um, so anthropology is a very big field and you can almost approach it from any angle. What I would advise is that you find something that is uniquely, that you can uniquely bring to the field. Because there's so many things you can do and I think people get bogged down by what they think they're supposed to do. Like, this is how you're supposed to do archaeology. This is how you're supposed to do, like, cultural anthropology. But you can bring in, you can allow yourself to enter the field and for yourself to change the field. There's a lot of conversation in the field about, you know, how do we get minority representation into anthropology and how do we allow all these different, um, how does diversity, like, affect anthropology and how does it make it better? And it only makes it better if, you don't just sort of bring people in and have them do the same thing. You sort of bring them in and allow them to use their experiences and their, their interests and their backgrounds to create new fields of study, new ideas, new projects. And so that's kind of what I would say is like, try to approach it from your unique perspective and not trying to do what you think everybody wants to see or what everybody else is doing. Because it's such a big field, right? So you can really do anything with it, so why not? Mm -hmm. Oh, that is great advice. 
Yeah, I like to think so. And we're doing some questions, right? Sure. So before she moves on to talk about what she's doing in her research, um, we can take a couple questions if you have some about what we've been talking about, her story, and kind of how she's right. found Or anything else. Oh, sure. Oh, there's like a mic. I don't know if we're supposed to. Sure. Shout it. <laughs> Cool. Um, I'm a political science major, and this is actually the semester where I decided to save all my science classes for, like, <laughs> till the end because I've just never been a science person. Uh huh. Um, but this year I've taken anthropology, physical anthropology, and um, the anthropo anthropology lab. Right. And I loved it, but I feel like I'm already so far in being a political science major that there's no way that I can all of a sudden just switch right before I'm about to transfer. Mm -hmm. Something poli sci based, mm -hmm. something international relations, and it's that step to that step to that step. So it's like when you learn something new, it's like you're just learning it because you have to, right? Not because it's going to help you in the discipline that you're learning. So just hearing this now, I'm wondering how do you take those steps or how, how do you do that? Um, so the, the good thing about the way grad school works, right, is that for the first two years at least, you're taking classes. You're taking undergrad classes, you're taking grad classes. Um, and those will be the things that will help you. So if you're thinking about, okay, how do I just change fields to something that I've only studied for this short amount of time, you will figure that part out because you will have the help because you will take those classes. You will have advisors and they will guide you to what you should, you know, what you should do and where you should crash course and what books you should read to catch up. Um, so that part is doable. So the changing part is doable. What you have to get yourself to is the mindset of flipping the script, right? Because you, you enter a field and you expect it to go a certain way and when you want to change it, it's difficult to get your mind around how is that even possible. It is doable. So the, phys the physical, like practical aspects of it, it's fine. You will take classes in, you will also teach classes. And that is a very good way to force yourself to learn something. Because when you're a teaching assistant, you have to know what you're talking about. And that is always, that's always helpful. Because then it, you teach like 101 classes, right? And so those are the basics. And you're like, okay, if I can understand, if the undergrads who are in their first year can understand this, so can I, right? And so you, you can move through those motions. You have to also just remember to, be, to go easy on yourself. That you will not know everything in your first year. You will not finish your first year and have caught up with everybody else. Like you won't. And you have to be easy on yourself. And I think what I, when I look back, what I remember is that I was way too hard on myself in the beginning. I, expect, I, I was way too hard on myself not knowing. I didn't, I had never really been in a position where I was the person in the room who didn't know what anyone else was talking about. I'd always put myself in positions where, you know, I was good at what, sorry, I was good at what I did. Um, so you have to just be easy on yourself. Allow yourself to learn at a steady pace, you know. It will be challenging at many points and just allow for that because that's part of the process. And grad school is long enough a time period that, like by your second year, right, your issues are no longer that you are picking up brand new things, it's that you are now trying to synthesize new thought with the rest of your people. So that first two years is a bit of a struggle when you don't have the background, um, but it is a very doable struggle because it's not like they throw you into the deep end. They, a, a professor who takes you knows that you, knows your background. And so it's not expecting you to suddenly be a perfect anthropologist straight from jump. Like they know you're not, and so there's no reason to assume such. But there are people who have done it, and there are people who have even done it from more drastically different fields than I have, who have changed you know, their, their fields of study to even more drastic things than from me, from biology to anthropology. So it's very, very doable. I think you just have to be easy on yourself and just let yourself learn at a particular pace, and it's, it'll be fine. It'll really be fine. 
you'll look back in your third year and you'll be like, oh, so it wasn't that deep. I really didn't need to, you know, be so high strung. <laughs> That's a good question. We can take one more before we move on. It could be about anything. Yeah. Anything at all. Sure. <laughs> Um, I w honestly would say it was really, really amazing. Um, it was, so for me coming in as an international student, it was, it was an education. Um, and so the cool thing is like now that I've, I'm now at a PWI, and it, I realize not everyone knows what that is, a predominantly white institution, um, you see the difference. Like the, the books we read, the scholars that we engage with are specifically like African and African American scholars or Afro Caribbean scholars. Like there is a specific, it introgresses into every field of study. You're studying biology and you're studying it from the perspective of an HBCU. Like everything is infiltrated into that general like ethos of trying to um, educate young black minds and really get them thinking about the world, even from like whatever they're studying. Like engineering students are engaging in engineering from an HBCU point of view. And so that's really good. There's also a very community feel of HBCUs I've noticed, where it's like this, it's a very like strong hustle mentality, like we have to do this great. So excellence is very, very much a strong, strong driver of everything. You have to be excellent at everything. But it's also this community thing of like, we have to help each other out. So your professors are concerned about you in a very different way. They're, they're, they're rooting for you in a very specific kind of way. And so that community feel of we're all here together and we all have to make it and we all have to be good and we all have to be excellent really is a very, like, really great way to cultivate your mind and your ideas and what you want to do with yourself in the future. And it's also a very collaborative place, right? Because um, your, my first research project was in the med school. We were studying facial muscles, but what we were studying was um, looking at old racist papers and trying to refute a lot of the scientific assertions that had been made. And so this is the, it could have just been a project on studying the face, but we had to tie it in to that general theme. And so I really, really enjoyed it, and I always tell people to like, if you even never attend one, just visit an HBCU. It's such a very different kind of school, and it's a unique experience like no other. Yeah. Great, thank you guys for your questions. This is gonna conclude the portion of sure. the event that is the interview. Thank you for letting me ask you questions about You're your fun. life. This is fun. <laughs> yep, and then she's gonna now talk about her research. Okay, I'm gonna put the pack. <laughs> Hello, can everyone hear me? Perfect, awesome. So, today I'm going to talk to you about the virtual reconstruction of the Kabara to Neanderthal pelvis. So, as I mentioned, right, my area of interest is the pelvis. And I have three major areas of interest that I like to study. So it's the pelvis, it's Neanderthals and modern humans, and it is 3D imaging techniques. Now these are the three major things that I knew I would enjoy doing. And this particular project that I'm going to talk to you about was my first attempt to blend all these areas together. So I chose the pelvis because it was anatomical and it, um, it was something that I had studied in undergrad and so it was able to draw in my undergraduate like, work and study to make sure that you know, four years of college wasn't wasted just because I went into a new field. And then I specifically chose Neanderthals and Modern Humans because I'm very interested in us, modern humans, but I'm also interested in seeing, you also have to have a comparative sample. So how do we differ from other hominins that came before us and lived with us? And how did we sort of interact when we weren't the only hominins on the planet? And so that really interested me. And the third thing that interested me was 3D imaging techniques, mostly because it's really cool. Um, that really was it. 
And so I combined these into a research project that I will talk to you about today. So before we get into the specifics of my project, I'd like to give you a little bit of background. So why do I study the pelvis? Well, the pelvis is a very important part of our bodies, and it's responsible for some critical anatomical parts, right? Some critical anatomical functions, like locomotion. So we need our pelvis to help us walk upright, right? We're bipedal. And then um, thermoregulation. So interestingly enough, your pelvis plays a big role in how your body manages heat, because the pelvis determines the width of your body. And the width of your body is part of the things that factor into the volume of your body, right? So the width is one of the calculations that goes into your volume. So the width of your pelvis actually determines the size that you will come out as, and therefore, it helps determine how much heat is stored or gained by the body, right? So if you have a, a structure, for example, that has the same diameter all the way around, if you increase the height, of that body, you still have the same surface area to mass ratio, regardless. And so, but if you reduce that diameter or you increase that diameter, then your surface area to mass ratio increases or decreases. And so that affects how you store heat and how heat is dissipated. And of course, your pelvis is important for childbirth, right? It's one of the most important anatomical structures for the process and mechanism of childbirth, which is a very, very important part of the evolutionary process, right? Fitness requires that you pass on your, uh, your genes to the next generation, and so the pelvis is a very critical player here. So it's a very important part of our bodies, and it's important to know how it evolves, because only then can we really understand how we function as like humans. So the pelvis has gone through many, many, many changes throughout uh, evolutionary history. So if it's changed in size, it has changed in shape. Um, and all of these changes have been to accommodate a lot of things, some of it being bipedal locomotion, but a lot of it being ac accommodating the head of the infant during childbirth. So when I think about it, you have a big-headed baby, you kind of need a big-headed, like a big pelvic canal for the baby to pass through. And so the pelvis has increased, oops, not only in size, but in shape. So when we look at the canals for the pelvis through evolutionary time, we can see that, for example, the early hominins had a pretty small pelvic canal, and then it widens into this kind of circular form, and then you get this sort of uh, V-shaped form for Heidelbergensis, and Homo sapiens have this slightly longer pelvis than we're used to seeing. So a lot of changes have happened in the shape, and these changes affect how childbirth occurs. It affects how a baby's head, for example, passes through the canal, how, how the baby rotates through the birth canal. It affects your stature, it affects your posture, how you stand, how you lean. Your center of gravity shifts with the sh shape of your pelvis, so it affects basically our um, basically ability to stand up the way we're standing up right now. And so all these things were things that I wanted to interrogate. Like, how have these things happened? What is the driver of all these changes? And what does it, how does it affect our ability to be us? And how has it shaped humanity as we know it today? So now I know this is a mixed room. So for the non-specifically paleoanthropologists amongst us, I'll do a quick overview of who the Neanderthals were compared to the modern humans. Because again, I'm reconstructing a Neanderthal pelvis, and the first question should be, why specifically a Neanderthal pelvis? Well, the Neanderthals were the closest relatives to us as Homo sapiens. And so that means that we can use them as a comparative sample. Um, they are 99.7% identical to us genomically. So that's really, really close. So we can also compare our genomes to the Neanderthal genome and understand what are the differences between us and them, and how did that shape the differences between our species. Um, they diverged from our lineage sometime around 600,000 years ago. So our divergence time, for example, modern humans arrive at this, this is the, where the modern humans begin, 
but the Neanderthal lineage um, diverged from our ancestor quite some time ago. But interestingly enough, we have evidence of interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans. So at about 100,000 years ago and at about 65,000 years ago, there was introgression into the Neanderthal lineage and introgression into the modern human lineage. So not only are we sort of very related to them, we also carry some of their genes today. In fact, every sort of non-Sub-Saharan African person has some Neanderthal um, in their genome. So these are things that we could also interrogate is how have those things affected us and them and their species. So when we talk about their anatomy, however, Neanderthals are very similar to modern humans, but also very different. It's kind of like an uncanny valley thing, you know, when you see something that looks human, but there's something off about it. Um, so Neanderthals, for example, have very similar cranial capacity to modern humans. So it means that our brain sizes were about the same. Now the shape of our crania is different. So what a lot of anthropologists are looking at is trying to interrogate whether does that mean that you know we had bigger portions of different parts of the brain maybe they had larger temporal lobes and we had larger frontal lobes for example or was it just shape difference but not really a size difference these are things people like to uh, are discussing um, they also had shorter legs and bigger bodies so they were much shorter than us i mean still within the range of modern humans today but as a whole population average, they were shorter. They were also wider. So if you look at the rib cage here, the modern human rib cage is like a barrel, right? And the Neanderthal rib cage is kind of more funnel shaped. So they had wider bodies, and their pelvis also, you know, was wider than our pelvis. And so that would have also affected their uh, body dimensions and thus affected their thermoregulatory abilities. So, so there's a common consensus right now that Neanderthals and modern humans have different shaped pelvises, right? Um, and the idea is that modern humans are longer front to back at the um, mid-plane and at the out, sorry. So modern humans are longer front to back at the mid-plane and at the outlet. So that means that, so for example, in modern humans, which is this first one, at the inlet, which is the part that is the upper part of our pelvis, of the pelvic canal, we are longer side to side. Now that makes sense, right? Our bodies tend to be wider side to side. But at the outlet, we are longer front to back. So there's a change in the dimension. And if you think about that in the terms of childbirth, uh, it means that a baby has to rotate itself out because the dimensions have changed from top to bottom. And the common consensus right now is that the Neanderthal pelvic canal doesn't change. Oops, sorry, don't know what that was. But that the Neanderthal pelvic canal doesn't change that much. That you have, that they're wider side to side at the inlet as well as at the outlet. And so, like I said, for childbirth, that has different implications. It probably means that you have less rotational birth. Now, the critical nature of rotational birth is well, well, we're not particularly sure, but how would this have affected um, the mortality rate between Neanderthals and modern humans? Is it an easy, or is any of these easier? Or is any of this safer? Like these are questions that we can sort of interrogate from these ideas. But the sort of main thing is we first have to more or less confirm the shape of the Neanderthal pelvis to be able to interrogate these questions further. So before we can say anything about childbirth possibilities and all these other things and thermoregulation, we should kind of have to know if we are indeed um, certain about this shape and structure in Neanderthals. Now I should also mention that this shape is particularly unique to modern humans, at least as far as we know. When we look at a lot of the archaic hominin specimens, we are more likely to find a shape that is more similar to the Neanderthals. So the common consensus right now is that modern humans uniquely develop this configuration and that Neanderthals are just following the rest of the archaic structure. But we also know, right, from what I said before, that we lived alongside the Neanderthals. We also intergressed with the Neanderthals. There's been intergression with the Neanderthal genome into our genome. So are we actually certain that this Neanderthal shape is how they retained it to the end of their, um, before they went extinct? So these are questions that we'd like to answer. So because we wanted to answer those questions, I decided to do 
a reconstruction of the most complete Neanderthal pelvis that we have. So the thing about the pelvis, and when you think about the structure, is that a pelvis is like a giant cavity, right? It's just bones surrounding a cavity. And when you bury something in that structure, what happens to it, right? You put sand on top of it and sediment, and it crushes down. So the pelvis is one particular part of our anatomy that is always poorly preserved in the fossil record. I mean, it is ridiculously poorly preserved in the fossil record. It is really difficult to find anything resembling a complete pelvis, especially once you get to the larger hominids. It, I mean, they're always smashed and broken and deformed. And so a lot of what we know about the Neanderthal pelvis is based on very few specimen, first of all, and it's based on a lot of work that was done in the 70s and the 80s. So what I wanted to do was say, we have new technology now. We have new ways of reconstructing work. Let's reconstruct some of these fossils and see if they really confirm those ideas that we had before. And so I started looking at the Kabara to Neanderthal. Now this is an adult male skeleton from uh, the Kabara cave in Israel. It was excavated in 1983 and is approximately 60,000 years old. And it has some of the most well-preserved postcrania that we have. So we don't have a skull, but we do have a lot of things. We have ribs, we have a rib cage, we have the pelvis, we have the um, upper limbs. We even have a hyoid bone, which is very, very rare to find in the fossil record. It's such a small bone, and we have it in this individual. So I was like, okay, we, let's work with this guy first, right? And so the first time that this was reconstructed, it was done by Yo Rack and um, um, Rack and Ironsburg in 1987. And what they did basically wasn't really a reconstruction per se, but it was more like they took the fossil, um, they made a cast of the fossil, they mirrored the left side. So if you look at the picture from this one, you notice that the right side, sorry, the right side is very well preserved for the most part. The left side, however, is missing some critical parts. And so you can't really reconstruct this because, I mean, this part's missing. So what they simply did was cut it in half, right? Create a hemipelvis, um, add some plaster to, this, to the missing sections. And this picture is just that half placed against a mirror. So the other side doesn't actually exist. This is just a mirror reflection. And so what we have for the former reconstruction is just a half pelvis of a non-reconstructed part. The only part that was reconstructed was this part where they added some plaster, so the pubic region, where they added some plaster. But everything else was left at is. And when I t remember what I said about how the pelvis tends to just crack into a million pieces? This is cracked into a million pieces. 39 pieces in the right um, pelvis to be exact. And so what happens when something is cracked and even in the ground is that bones shift, right? And so everything is not quite where it should be anatomically. And so what I was looking at, I said, well, we can do better than this now, right? We have so many new techniques that can allow us to reconstruct this much, much better. And so why is this pelvis particularly important? Well, because it is one of the most complete Neanderthal pelvises, and when I say one of the most complete, so we have fragments from other Neanderthals, pelvises, right? We have a fragment here, a fragment there, maybe part of one bone here or there. What we don't have is anything that can give us a complete pelvis. We don't have a lot of those. We basically have two. There's like two pelvises that we have that can give us any idea of a full pelvic canal. And so we're working with sample size two here. So a lot of the inferences that people are making about Neanderthal anatomy is based on these two specimens. So the least we could do is get it right. And so um, we decided that we were, I was going to study um, this particular pelvis and then try to do a proper reconstruction. And so take care of a lot of this cracking, first of all, and try to like fill in the parts that are missing and also try to correct some of the deformations that we could see on the bone. We're specifically more um, concerned about the deformations than anything. Because cracks, it's fine. You can leave the cracks in there. But where bones have shifted is really what's going to change the anatomy. Um, I want to see if this would, this would play. So yeah, so when you rotate this part, 
if you notice, this, um, the issue of pubic ramus, if you look at it, it kind of dips right around here. So there's, a, there's been a crack here, there's been a crack here, and so this part has sort of caved in on itself. And so my major area was looking at how do these um, deformations affect what we think about the shapes and the dimensions of this pelvis. So the first thing that I did was take a look at what parts did we have. So Kabara has a left denominate, right, that is pretty, pretty damaged. It's, lo it's lost the entire pubic region. Um, we have the right denominate that is more or less complete for the most part. And we have a sacrum. So we have enough parts to build a complete pelvis. So, but you also notice that there's also damage to the sacrum as well. For one thing, this side of the sacrum, which is the left side. So remember, if you're looking at anatomical structures, they kind of flip because you're facing them. So the left side is actually more damaged than the right, first of all. There's a lot more cracking. There's a lot more shifting of bone. You also have regions where the sacrum never fused. Now, if you know anything about human anatomy, at some point, your bones fuse together, right? Little kids' bones are everywhere. And then they eventually fuse into adulthood. This individual is an adult, but part of his bones never fuse. And so when your bones don't fuse and you're lying on the ground and there's no musculature to hold it together, things shift. And so we notice that there's been a shifting of the, so there's a gap, there's an opening right here. There's also like some shifting that has happened at the top right here. So if you notice, it's sort of lipped in. And so these are some of the things that we were going to correct. So the first thing that I did was we got CT scans of the pelvis. So I was going to do a virtual reconstruction. Why a virtual reconstruction? Well, if I try to reconstruct the actual fossil, I run the risk of damaging it. I cannot replace this fossil. Someone will have my head. And so a virtual reconstruction is basically the only way that you can sort of manipulate and play around with the bones without any damage to the original which is why virtual reconstructions is really the way scientists are going now with literally every reconstruction. And so what I did was we got an industrial CT scanner to scan um, this pelvis. It was done in Germany and uh, the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, Germany. Um, it was done at a very high resolution scan, so it's really, really good um, graphics and imaging. Um, so the first thing you do is you have your CT scan, which is this. And then you have to create volume renderings. Now, what are volume renderings? So you load this into your computer graphic program. And, but what I want is I want to be able to play this like a puzzle, like literally like a puzzle game. So I need all the fragments to be individually identified. So you create volume renderings, which are the individual identified um, pieces of each fragment. And so what you get is this. So when I say what you get is this, what I mean is I spent one year painstakingly going through this particular thing to identify every individual fragment that exists. A year. Fun times. Um, and so what I had to do is go through So if you know what a CT scan looks like, it's just slices right, of an image that are piled together to make a 3D image. And so you just go through slice by slice on um, using the computer's tools to like, identify each section of each graphic. So this is why this is painstaking, because you make a lot of errors. You go back and you look at it and you go, oh, that bone is not part of that fragment, it's part of this fragment. And so you go back, you take it out, and you do it again. And you have to identify each fragment. So I think we identified 39 fragments on this particular bone alone. Then go through the process of once you've identified each individual fragment, you can manipulate them, you can move them around. And so what at the end of the day is, we were able to correct some of those deformations. And I'm just showing you this particular one because I highlighted it before. But see, if you look at that crack, right? If you look at the first reconstruction, we've straightened out that bar. We've straightened out that issue of pubic ramus. I also wanted to show in my work how an individual's biases affects their scientific work. This is not something that a lot of scientists like to highlight. I mean, we talk about it amongst ourselves, but it's not something you want to put in your paper originally. It's like, sure, it might be right, but who knows? But I really wanted to highlight that like, if I'm doing this reconstruction, if somebody else does this reconstruction, we could come out with different results because we're not really working with any frame of reference, right? This is, we're just working with the bones that we have. And so I had another um, grad student in my department, and very grateful to him, redo the reconstruction and see what he would come out with. 
And we came out with slightly different results. So if you look at the green one, uh, the issue of pubic bar it sort of rises up much more than this one does. This one sort of has a curvature where it sort of folds um, up in a little bit of a curve, so it kind of goes like this. And this one is sort of like a straight reconstruction, and it lifts it up. Now, what happens with that is that's going to affect a lot of width of the pelvis, either the width or the length. But things will be different. And so I wanted to make sure that I also highlighted that when you're doing virtual reconstruction, it's not an exact science. It's your best estimation based on your research and your understanding of anatomy and your understanding of a lot of different subjects piled into one. And I really wanted to highlight that. So then we reconstructed the sacrum. And what we did here was just basically, it's actually the fun part. So take the sacrum, mirror image, um, I sort of corrected it already as much as we possibly could. Mirror image it, so just flip it, right? And then superimpose those two images together. And I did this for a specific reason. You're going to see why later. I superimposed it, and then I just took out the other sides that I didn't want. So the left side, I just took out the left side on both of them. So the true left side and the mirrored left side. And so what you have is this symmetrical image. Now, why did I do this? Because I want to build a complete pelvis, not a half pelvis like we've been dealing with before. But I also know that the left side is really damaged. So what I was just going to do is, instead of using an actual mirror and trying to take a picture of it, to create that mirror image in a physical form. And so by making this symmetrical, I can also mirror that right bone that was complete to the other side, and it will make like a complete pelvis. And so this is the end result. So now we have a virtual file of a full pelvis, reconstructed, correcting a lot of the de deformations, right? And now I can look at the full pelvic canal. So now I can actually see, remember I showed you a couple of all the um, pelvises from the earlier hominins and we looked at the shape. Now I can do the same analysis for Kabara in a way that we couldn't do before. So now when I'm talking about Nyan's whole pelvic anatomy and the shape of the birth canal and the shape of the pelvic canal, I actually have something that I can look at and point to, not sort of like some half thing that we have to multiply all the numbers by two to get any sort of understanding. And now, it's fun to do virtual reconstruction work. You can manipulate stuff in the computer. You can take your measurements there. You can use a lot of cool programs to do a lot of fun research. But I wanted to compare this to the work that had been done before. So what did previous scientists come up with? What was their result? What was their answer, right? So remember I told you about the first reconstruction. The um, Yo Rack and, um, and uh, Alon Ironsberg were able to come up with a lot of different like, understanding of Neanderthal anatomy from their reconstruction. What I wanted to do is see, does my reconstruction change some of those assertions? Does it affect anything that we thought of previously? And to do that, I wanted to make my measurements comparable to theirs. So how did they take their measurements in 1987? Um, well, with a ruler and with calipers and a whole bunch of anthropometric tools. So I decided to do the same thing here. But that means I need a physical copy of this as well. And this is the fun part. Got my advisor to buy a 3D printer. You can get a lot of things done, apparently, as a grad student. And so we had a 3D printer, and we were able to 3D print the pelvis. And so now, in my office, um, we have about three 3D printed pelvises of the Kabara Nyantal pelvis. Now, 3D printing is also pretty cool. It's relatively cheaper these days to get done. It also means you don't have to ask one researcher for a cast. If I put the file online, you could print it if you wanted to. So now it's easier for people to get access to a lot of this information, right? It's easier for other people to do studies. Who knows, one of you in here might one day decide to say that my reconstruction is crap and then decide to do it yourself. But you'll need access to my files and you could probably get it once I post it in an open source um, area. And so this allows us to really do a lot of things with it. I remember now I told you that I got someone else to do the reconstruction. So I also have their copy of their reconstruction on my desk. And so I can compare what are the differences between these two. If I did a physical reconstruction of the fossil, you can only do it once, right? Because you can't move it around just because you want to play with it. And so this is a really cool thing. So what were my results? What did I find out? Well, when I compare the numbers, right, the original reconstruction and mine, so mine is VR1. Just assume that mine is VR1 and the other person was VR2. VR1, which is mine, came out with similar bi-iliac breath, so as wide as the old one. Um, but the other researcher came out with a much, much 
smaller reconstruction. And I have some ideas about why that is. I think he kind of made a very narrow sacrum um, in his mirroring. It probably just introgressed it a little bit more. Um, the shape of the inlet, right? Because we're concerned about the shape of the inlet mostly because of body dimension, but also because of um, what birthing structure looks like. And so the shape of this particular inlet um, mean, um, shows that mine is, there's been an increase. Sorry, those, um, the text is a little bit wrong because I edited that, but I didn't change this. But there's been some increase. So the inlet length, so this direction, is longer in both our reconstructions. The width is slightly narrower. So what we've come up with is this pelvis that is not as circular oval as was previously thought. Now, if you remember what I said about Neanderthal and modern human pelvises, this means that this pelvis moves down the spectrum closer to the modern human configuration. So it's not as neanderthal -y as we thought it was, I guess. That's even a word. Shape of the outlet also sees similar changes, right? You have a, um, you have a, actually this one's actually quite interesting because now you have a diversion. So for my reconstruction, it stays around a similar number for the length but the other person was able to create a longer outlet, right? So even more towards the modern human configuration. But the width um, of theirs was more similar. So we have something going on here. I haven't quite parsed this out, but this is the fun of what I'm trying to do lately. But there's a lot of different shape um, possibilities that we're looking at here. Um, we also were very concerned about something, which was the length of the inlet within the pelvis. So when you think about your pelvic inlet or the canal of your pelvis, you have to also think about where it sits in the body. So if this diagram is actually a really cool diagram, right? The areas that are in black represent the modern human shape, the sort of stereotypical Caucasian male modern human pelvic shape. And if you notice, that their sacrums are more pushed back than the Neanderthal one. The Neanderthal one sort of pushes forward a little bit more. So it creates more of a heart shape inside your pelvis, right? If your sacrum moves in more, your pelvis is no longer circular, it's more heart shaped. Um, but it also means that this pubic region is also pushed out more in the Neanderthal, so it's really more heart shaped, it's really like a heart shaped pelvis, but the modern male one is more oval, right? Now, my reconstruction pushes this thing, this pubic region, even more forward. So creating even more of a pointed outlet, or more, uh, we, call them, we call the android shape. So it's even more pointed outward, and the sacrum is even more pushed forward. So this means that the pelvic inlet is sitting more forwardly, more anteriorly within the body. Now this can have some really um, cruel implications for balance. If your spine is shifted more inside of your body and your pelvis is moved out, you might you, won't you might not necessarily stand the way we do stand as modern humans because your center of gravity has now shifted. And so when we're talking about how did Neanderthals walk about, what was their gait like, this is, becomes a very critical thing in understanding were they standing upright quite like we were? Were they leaning in any direction? Um, was it easier for them to walk? How were the muscles of their legs moving? These are all things that suddenly can change with every given reconstruction. And of course, the sacrum also changed in shape because we closed up some of those gaps. It became even more curved, which is part of the reason why that sacrum pushes further into the pelvis, right? The edges sort of curve more into the pelvis so that you have, um, you know, you have both them at the top and at the bottom, both pushing forward into the pelvis. And lastly, you have the subpubic angle, which is the angle below um, the pelvis right at the anterior portion. And in my reconstruction and in the other person's reconstruction in my lab, we reduce the subpubic angle. So the modern human range is very, very far away from these two, but ours put it closer to the more modern human range. So it's around 60 something um, um, degrees for the modern human range. And Neanderthals, which have a wider pelvis, right? Our reconstruction shows that maybe it's similar or not as wide as we previously thought. So what these two reconstructions show at the end of the day, right, is that the, our understanding of Neanderthal anatomy might be different in the sense that 
we could have actually a rounder, more modern-like pelvis than we thought before for Neanderthals. So not necessarily modern at all, but if you think about them as a spectrum, the, our reconstruction has pushed the Neanderthal pelvis slightly closer in the direction of modernity than in the sort of more ar archaic structure. So all of these things are inferences that we've made from this particular reconstruction process. And later we're gonna do some more geometric morphometric analysis. So we're gonna look more about a lot of the shape dimensions and how it, um, it differs from modern humans, for example. And so how it does it differ from modern humans from a similar population, right? Maybe the Israeli population. And how does that differ from a Caucasian population or an African population? And see whether they do fit anywhere in the modern human range and what that means for our understanding of their anatomy. Do we have human analogs that we can actually look to? And so, yeah, so we're gonna do a lot of that. And then for future, I'm gonna assess soft tissue structure for fossils. So the good, cool thing about 3D imaging is you can do a lot of it with it, right? So we're gonna be looking at CT scans and looking at the shape of soft tissue that holds the pelvis together. And to help us do a better, more accurate reconstruction. Because we also need to know what the soft tissue that held the joints together would have looked like and how big is it. And so that should help us with a better reconstruction. And we're also using to look at other imaging techniques to help us with fossils that don't have as much complete parts and so that we can use some algorithms and some calculations to help us infer other parts of the pelvis based on small fragments that we have. So we're doing a lot of things with 3D imaging, we're doing a lot of things with the pelvis, and all of it is to help us understand how Neanderthals and modern humans um, relate to one another and what it means to be modern human, and if Neanderthals were that different from us or how similar they were to us in the end. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Maya, and uh, we enjoyed the story. It was all down here. We enjoyed <laughs> the presentation very much, and um, we have uh, time if there's maybe one question. If sure. someone would like to ask um, a question, yes, in the front here. Of C-sections? Um, so interestingly enough, I do think that C-sections could have some impact on the shape, or on, on hum, human evolution in a way, because a C-section basically helps you with a, a, a birth that can maybe not go through the birth canal, right? Or it, it's an optional thing, but it, it, it's used also in areas where, for example, maybe the baby's head is too large to pass through the birth canal. And so this could allow for larger skulled individuals, right, who in a more archaic context would not have survived the birthing process to then survive into the population and pass on those genes to their own offspring. So it could actually have some impact on human like anatomy, particularly in the skull structure, in that you now have a range of individuals with maybe larger than the regular norm of skulls because you now have technology that can help us reduce the mortality rate of those kinds of births. So yeah, it could have an impact. Look out for big-headed people, basically. <laughs> uh, would anyone else like to ask a question? One final question from Iowa? Can we on anything? Good. This or anything else? One over. So interestingly, right, I keep talking about birth and then I use the male. So, what we try to do is try to look at the relationship between male pelvises and female pelvises, right? Female pelvises are wider because of childbirth. So all my inferences about a female pelvis from this, and we are gonna try to create a hypothetical female from this, is that we also assume that the same would have been true for Neanderthals. And so just thinking about this in the ratio between the male and, the, uh, male and female modern humans and applying that to Neanderthals, right? And saying, so from this, what do we infer about what a Neanderthal female could? And so yes, all these changes would affect a Neanderthal female. Um, we do have some ideas about Neanderthal female pelvic structure. There's one reconstruction, which was done by my advisor in his graduate project. It's like history repeating itself. Um, and so we're gonna sort of compare and see if we create a hypothetical female from this, does it differ from his reconstruction? 
Are we working with a different range? Because I suspect from what I know of his reconstruction and what I know of mine, that my hypothetical female is going to be not as wide as his Neanderthal female reconstruction. And so this could also help us understand what's the range of possibility here? What, because humans are different, right? You have so much variation. So what is the range of variation that we can infer from Neanderthal? So yes, they would all affect uh, the f females as well. Maybe give them a rounder inlet instead of like a really oval one. Thank you for the questions. And uh, Mayo, I would like to say that we actually recently got a 3D printer oh, in our Anthro you. Lab. Yes, we did. And so hopefully when you're ready to release that file, we'll be able to yes. maybe have our own reconstructions. Yeah, um, cool. Work, yeah, that's the goal. Be a that's cool addition to our lab, I think. Yeah. So um, we'd like to thank Mayo for coming out today to CRC in this uh, weather situation. <laughs> and um, if anyone has questions and wants to stick around after to ask a question or two, we'll yeah. be here for a few more minutes. So thank you again, Mayo. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.